it's that time of the day, certainly my favourite time of the day, the GB News pub is fully open. It's Talking Pints. I'm joined by music impresario Pete Waterman. Pete, welcome. Cheers, thank you. Now, we all know you, Stock Aitken Waterman, these amazing, unbelievable number of successes that you had, hundreds of hit records, unbelievable what you did. But what's really interesting are the jobs you did before before all of that. I mean, just run us through some of the jobs that you did when you were young. Well, I was a grave digger. You grave digger, yeah. Not for long, but I was a grave digger. Yeah. I went down the pit. Um, I worked on the railway as a fireman, and I worked in the telecommunications industry as a, a, a technician. What was it like working down the pit? Well, it's a great story, this. I went down the pit, and I got to the bottom. I was, at the time, I was well overweight. And I uh, got to the bottom and the guy said, you're a bit of a big lad to be down here. I've got a job for you on top, making cement. So I actually only spent about an hour downstairs and then <laughs> I was on the top <laughs> making cement. And I went from about 17 and a half stone to about 11 stone in about eight weeks. Don't think I've ever worked so hard in my life. It's dreadful. And you worked on the railways for a bit. I did, yeah. And you are a sort of full-on railway nut, basically. Uh, yeah, like you could say that, yeah. Would have been, I think, would have been cheaper if I did drugs, yeah. <laughs> You've invested in all sorts of railways. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a, I've travelled by train all my life. I yep. um, didn't drive till I was about 26, 27. I've commuted by, tr by train for, since 1972, 71. Yep. I still do three or four train journeys a week. I do not understand why people drive cars. Although I have a very nice car and I sometimes have to drive it because it's the only place I can get. I, I, I have used public transport all my life and, and, and I've, I've found it perfectly fit for purpose. They, home for you, the West Midlands, obviously. That was, yeah. I live in the northwest now. But very much where... Well, this is even more relevant, right? Because right. I had the Conservative Member of Parliament for Litchfield sitting where you're sitting the other day. And we were talking about trains and, in particular, HS2 and the cost of it. And his argument was, Michael Fabrigan's argument was, well, actually, from Litchfield to London, it's only like an hour and 15 minutes anyway, that from Manchester to London, I think the fastest trains are two hours, six minutes, seven yeah, minutes, yeah, yeah. That, that actually, is it really worth spending 100, 150 billion quid? And he's the MP for Litchfield, is he? He's the MP for Litchfield, yeah. Well, he ain't very bright, then, is he? Well, you tell me, because I'm well, not convinced. Well, OK. Uh, where's Coventry compared with Litchfield? Oh, Further south, right? Yeah. yeah, 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 of course. Well, I can tell you now that yep. Coventry from Euston is exactly one hour, 100 miles exactly, mm -hmm. right? Crew on HS2 is 58 minutes. Crew's farther up north than Litchfield ever will be by yeah, a long way. Does saving 10 minutes matter that much? No, it's not saving 10 minutes, Nigel. Crew is yep. currently one hour yes. and thirty-five minutes. Well, oh, 35 minutes. Yeah. Sorry, it's yeah. going to save. Yeah. It's going to save thirty-eight minutes. But more important, it moves it moves crew from the North Midlands mm -hmm. to the South Midlands. It puts it right at the. Heart. So it'll drive more business to London. No, it drive more business like me back to. I listen. I I I got this job because I could commute in under an hour. I didn't need to buy a house in London. So I came back, but I took my wealth back to the Midlands. Yeah. And when I, when I really started this, what did I open my studios? In Manchester. All right, so you're an HS2 enthusiast then? Yeah, absolutely. It's a big cost, isn't it? No, it's cheap. No, it's not cheap. It's cheap. Oh, well, how's it Come cheap? on, how much has this pandemic cost us? And what have we got out of it? Oh, I know that. Nothing. Well, I know that. We haven't got anything out of it. But isn't the point? Where's 20,000 jobs? Nigel, our problem Let's, is in... That uh, amount of money could be spent on infrastructure projects all over the United Kingdom. No, it couldn't. It could not benefit. We cannot modernise the railway with, with patching it up. You've got places like Primrose Hill Tunnel. You've got Killsby Tunnel. These tunnels are so big and so t restrictive, they stop us. It, it is a bit Victorian, some of the systems. It's a yeah. complete I get Victorian. That. I get that, I get that. I just look at the massive cost of it. But, no, but anyway, you well, are... Let's talk about the massive cost, but, right? But, you know, I, we, could, I was on transport for the... You it know, could be 150 a, billion quid, yeah. OK. But I was a, a director of Transport for the North, one of the first directors yep. on Transport for the North. I know how much subsidy the Treasury has to put into the North West to keep it afloat, OK? It's huge compared with what it has to put in London and the South East. London and the South East is this amazing place which pays for most of us to live. Well, let's put a bit more 
into the northeast, the northwest, the Midlands, because then it will generate more. If I mean, it did, if it did, if I really thought it would, I might change my mind. But I'll tell you what puts me off ever so slightly. The TGV in right. France, all right? You know, I spent lots of time in France as an MEP, go to Strasbourg and all the rest of it. When I was first elected to the European Parliament, it was five hours from Paris to Strasbourg. By the time I left the European Parliament, it was two hours, 14 minutes. I mean, completely different. Yeah. Um, Bigger country, though. Yeah, no, no. Marseille was six hours from Paris, but with the TGV, it was three hours from Paris. And Lyon, correspondingly, again, much, much closer. And the experience in France was that a lot more businesses in Marseille headquartered in Paris than they had before. It drove business into Paris. Now, if it works the other way around here, okay. I get the point, but I'm, okay. but I'm we, not sure. We have... A, ah, right, well, let's take Warrington, where I live. Yep. Has a unique place. Unique. More people come into Warrington to work than going to Manchester or Liverpool. That's because Warrington has built a case around a nuclear industry. So if you look at Warrington, yeah. there's more people go in than go out in the morning for jobs. And good roads. Yes. Around Warrington, the roads are, right. you know, Because are good. there's a great industry. Yeah. Yeah. So it proves that if you do build it, which is why I work so hard to get crew as the first, you know, hub for HSG, because yeah. it opens the whole of the northwest, so North Wales. When this is completed, it'll stop in Birmingham, it'll yep. stop in Crewe. Yep. And then Manchester. And then we hope... Liverpool and Warrington will come off on a spur. And then there was the line that was going to go up to Leeds, wasn't there? The... You know, Nigel, that's a problem. And I'll tell you why it's a problem. It's not a problem of the cost or what it is. It's a problem of the people that, that live in that part of the world that don't want it built, that can't see like we did in the northwest, like Andy Burnham and, and, and the people in Crewe and Warrington and, and Liverpool. We see there's a massive benefit for, for bringing it there. When I was on the commission for the Treasury that we went round Britain looking at the value where we could get yeah. this, we found absolute apathy, and I mean apathy, in the East Midlands and Yorkshire. It was just, they didn't want to know. No. So if they don't want to know, you're not going to get it. <laughs> if you don't fight for it, you're not going to get it, are you? Well, Pete, I have to say, your passion for this is, is it's real. It's very, very, oh, very it's strong. Real, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm still not totally convinced, but you've put the argument and I'm, I'm very, very pleased to hear it. But when you were doing all these different jobs, the grave digging and cement making and briefly going down the pit and all the rest of it, collecting records, this was, this was clearly... I mean, were you kind of... Rock and roll was just really kicking off, I guess, in the late 50s, or...? Well, I started collecting, I think, in truth... I remember, like, buying a Woolworths um, radio with, you know, two earphones. I was about, I, was about, I guess, six or seven, eight. Got it for Christmas, and I could go in, you know into bed, and my mum didn't know this, because she'd have died if she thought I was in bed listening to the radio. <laughs> but I used to listen to American Forces Network, yep. Radio Luxembourg, and, and stations like that. Um, and I started to collect, you know, the records that you heard. Um, and they fascinated me. The cultural thing really fascinated me. And um, I was lucky enough that my, I had an auntie who lived in Leicestershire. Of course, the nuclear strike force in those days was at Bruntingthorpe and Upper Hayford, which were very much within my patch. And my mum and dad used to go to a pub at the end of the runway at Bruntingthorpe, and the American GIs used to come out and they used to bring the records from the jukebox and give them to my mum because they played skittles in the pub. Uh, and so I started collecting these American records, you know. And then, you know, you start doing parties because you've got these records that... Kids don't know. So you're in demand? Yeah. I get ten bob and a, you know, bar a barrel of beer. You know, one of them at Tangs, what they were called, bumper packs. The worst beer in the world, weren't they? Bloody awful. Was it Watney's or whatever? Oh, it was? God. God. Family packs, I think. You know, you sit in the corner and play records, you know, and I got ten bob. Well, my dad was probably earning, I don't know, six, five, six, seven quid in the factory. I was getting ten bob for playing records at the, you know, that I loved. So I thought, well... There's got to be something in this. And where does the re when does the real revolution start? When I met the Beatles. Is it the Beatles? Oh, yeah, without question. I I'd never seen anything like them. I mean, I've worked with lots of acts and seen lots of acts at that point. But, you know, these four lads went on stage and Ringo Starr still wasn't with them at that point. And they just went on stage and went, one, two, three, four, and I, I went, what? It was like, whoa, what is this? It was like, 
I guess like punk was. It was so energetic, so different. And, you know, they had Levi jeans on. Well, we didn't see Levi jeans in Coventry. I mean, you know, only <laughs> Americans wore <laughs> Levi jeans. My God, they got Levi jeans on. You know, and this guitarist had a Jet Atkins Gretsch. It's like, wow, this guy's got a Gretsch, you know. They must be American. Couldn't understand them anyway because they talked, you know, from Liverpool. So it was like, but there were, it was just an impact. It was like, okay. Yeah. This is giving me goosebumps. Why is it giving me goosebumps? Because this is what I, I want to do. You know, this is like. But it took off, didn't it? Oh, then you know, people forget, and you try. You know, I do lecture occasionally. Just colleges. There was no social media. No. BBC didn't had the home service and the light program. Yeah. You know, and within three weeks of me seeing them at the. And no radio one. No radio one. Within three, no pirate radio at all. Only Radio Luxembourg. Uh, within three weeks, they played at the Nuneaton Co-op Hall and it was packed. I mean, packed. So between, just in three weeks, they'd gone from probably 40 people at the venue that I was at yeah. till 2,500. And, of course, then within a month and a half, all the daily papers have picked up Beatlemania. Amazing. And yeah. you decide, this is it. Yeah, this is it. I've got to be in music. Yeah, because you... you but how you do you, as, as someone that's not coming with any particular advantages to all of this, how do you go to where you got to in the 80s? I mean, how does all that happen? You just decide to do it. Simple as that? Yeah, because I can't read and write. So This is the other thing I was fascinated by. No, I couldn't read or write, so I couldn't be told. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing was different. You know, I didn't know you, you couldn't do this. I didn't understand that there were barriers to this. I just never understood that. Because to me, there were no barriers. You know, when I, when I saw these bands, you know, the Beatles play, and they played things like Mr Moonlight and um, Hippie Hippie Shake, well, I've got these records that I've been playing for months, you know, and it's like, well, they're doing what I do. They, they're, they're obviously talented enough to do it on a guitar, but I've got the records, so I can make people as entertained. So I didn't see that whole thing about... Uh, you can't do this because you've got to go to work at half past seven in the morning. Mm. It's like, no, 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 I'll go half past seven in the morning. That's fascinating. But if I've got to get home for one o'clock, I'll get home. And you finish up, stock Aki Waterman, and you've got the lot, haven't you? You know, Banana, Rama, and all these big hits. And how many top ten hits did you... Oh, God, 22 number ones, I think, yeah. 22 number ones. Was it all just mass market, easy... No, it was hard work. Was it, was it good music or was it, was it just commercial music? It's still around now. So, uh, well, I only make commercial music. Yeah. I don't make music people to judge me by. I don't, that's not what I'm interested yeah. in. They either like it or they don't. I don't like I Listen, I need their cash. Yep. Pay me in, <laughs> pay me in cash, don't pay me in gold watches. This is... It's like this Mozart. Is. It's like, uh, don't, you won't offend me by giving me a fiver. OK, so if you don't want to review my records, that's fine. Just, you know... I always said to people that, that they gave me all this grief, hang on, I walk down the street, kids walk up to me and say... When's the next Banana Rama album, man? Yeah. In other words, yeah. when can I give you another fiver? <laughs> How many people are lucky enough to walk down the street and kids say, no, would you like a fiver? Yeah, well, thank you very much. It's amazing. And how have you found living with that kind of fame? Easy, actually, Nigel. If you don't, don't want it, you don't go out. You stay in. Yeah. When you go out, you're in a public And domain, people want to talk to you the whole time. And people want to talk to you. Yeah then that's what you've got to do. That's what you get paid yeah. to do. Yeah. If you don't want to go out, I don't go out. You know, when I go out on the railway, people talk to me because they know that, you know, they've got an opinion about the railway. Not everything the railway does is perfect, but it does in the majority of cases. You know, we've just had this whole fiasco at the weekend where they're trying to save the planet. Well, we've been, you know, on the railway, we've been... Let's be honest, we've been... Penny pinching, we've been, you know, recycling carriages for the last 75 so, years. Are you a bit sceptical about net zero, then? I'm sceptical about people that turn up in entourages, private jets, private yachts, well, and try and tell me <laughs> that they're here to save the planet. And, you know, I'm listening to the BBC about climate change, and then they have a programme about going to Mars. <laughs> you know, and having private <laughs> flights around the Earth. You're going... Hang on a minute. Whoa, <laughs> wait a minute. If we if we take it serious, then let's take it serious. Yeah. But then we're too far along the line now of blurring the lines between what you can recycle and what is and what isn't proper. In other words, big business can come in, in front too many times of practicalities. Mm. I mean, we do things on the railway now. Ten years ago, we would have never thought about doing. Well, who would have known? 
Who would have known that getting Pete Waterman in, we'd get a lecture about railways, we'd be told all about the Beatles in the early days, and a guy who's achieved that level of success, who, as he says, couldn't read and write properly. Amazing. Pete Waterman, thank you for joining me here on Talking Pints. Cheers. Bruce. Cheers. Well, that was great. It's the end of the show. It's now Barrage the Farage, where you send in your questions that I don't get any chance to see beforehand. So, fingers crossed, and here goes. Jackie asks me, if the GPs go on strike, will anybody even notice? <laughs> well, that's a very good question. Look, I'm, I'm really... What's disappointing, and I've made this point more than once here, is that GPs were the most respected members of our local communities. We all looked up to the GP. They were the people that came to visit the house when your kids were ill or your dad was ill or whatever it was. Um, and I feel they've withdrawn from society. I worry that the British Medical Association now sound more, more like a trade union. Um, and I think we're starting to lose some respect for GPs, and that is not a good thing. Clive asks me, oh, here we go, if Trump got the nomination to stand again, would you cross the pond and support him? Look, I like Donald Trump. I think he stands for the right things. I think in terms of recognising the threat that China poses to the rest of us. He was way ahead of the game and has woken people up. And I think, frankly, you know, when it comes to the whole cancel culture, woke agenda, Trump believes in free speech, I believe in free speech. Some people don't like his style. He's a bit of a brash New Yorker, but I've always supported him. And, yes, I always will. Gary asks me... No, Clive asks me... No, I've done that one. Camilla asks me, if you could choose any job in the world, what would it be? I think having a pint with Pete Waterman actually isn't too bad, frankly. <laughs> I think it's pretty good. I'm pretty happy with it. Right, I've got... Uh, no, that's it. We're done. We're over. Pete, thanks ever so much. Nigel, thank you. For coming in. It's been terrific. <laughs>is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m., Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. that time of the day the GB News pub is now open and joining me for Talking Pints is economist Vicky Price. Vicky welcome to the show and thank you for being here. It's interesting you, you know you grow up in Greece and you come to this country and you become an economist and you've had a, a very distinguished career. You've worked for big banks, for KPMGs, you've, had, you've held some really very very big jobs and been a very successful Economist, but I really want to take you back to Greece because I could, I mean, you know, I could see that the Eurozone might well work for uh, the low countries and Germany and 
maybe France. I could see how an optimal currency zone did potentially, political questions, but did potentially exist. But Greece joined the euro on, it seemed to me, a pretty spurious set of statistics. I mean, what has it done to your home country? The first thing to say is that everyone fiddled the statistics a little bit in order to get in. Uh, but I've written a book called Greekonomics where I showed very clearly that the euro was not an optimal currency at the time, yeah. uh, which I mean, you know, soon after it was um, developed and then adopted by all these countries. And it remained not being an optimal currency for quite some time. I also worked a little bit on the five economic tests that we did here in the UK when I was working for the government. I didn't believe that the euro was a good idea for us to join, although I'm a real europhile, and of course I was I mean, Greek-born, yep. and cared a lot about what would happen to Greece. But I didn't think that at the time of the euro crisis, Greece should leave. It would have been too painful. So I'm afraid Greece had to suffer hugely over that period. And in my mind, wrongly, yes, of course, there were things that were done early on which were mistakes, overspending, the Olympics, which really affected the, the fiscal position very significantly. And maybe, again, the statistics didn't tell you the entire story at the time. But after that point, I think Europe should seriously have helped Greece. And well, Germany and France were completely ar- against it at the end of the day. Arguably, Greece was bailed out. Yes, but it was bailed out at some huge cost to Greece. I mean, no other country saw a drop in GDP of 26% yeah. over a number of years. And the interesting thing is it didn't just happen. Of course, here in the UK, we just had a 20% fall in GDP yeah. in one year. OK, and now we're recovering. Now, there you had falls year after year after year. And it got into a sort of vicious cycle. So it was just getting worse and worse because every time the EU or the MF would come and see that, in fact, the fiscal deficit was still in trouble. They would encourage raising taxes even more or reducing incomes for the people who work in the public sector or cut pensions, which, of course, then means less to spend. And democracy out of the window, effectively. Well, sort of. But it did work. The democracy, strangely, you know, showed that it can still survive despite that. And to me, the most amazing thing of this whole affair was that the Greeks, even though there were demonstrations we all saw on television here, the Greeks accepted it and actually did what they were saying. I'm amazed. I'm amazed. I couldn't see it. I thought they'd rebel. Well, they rebelled up to a point, but really nothing like what Mm. you would have expected. And you saw this again with COVID, that they had very strict rules, seriously strict rules from the very beginning. And even until last summer, a few months ago, you had curfews. You had to get back home by nine. Amazing, times by six. And they did it. And you just thought... Which, you, I, know, I, I, I find it all hard to believe. I really, really do. Now, as an economist, you're going to be very much in demand, in my view, over the course of the next few years, because suddenly uh, economics, money, is rising up the list of people's priorities, um, the cost of living, the commodity price boom that we're seeing across all sectors. Uh, inflation. Mm which I mean, you've got to be over 50 to even remember what inflation really is. What is we've, we've had central banks. We've had Bank of England, the Fed, telling us for the last year, don't worry your poor little heads about inflation. It's only a transitory thing. It's not really a problem. What's your view of inflation? Again, we need to remember where we started, particularly in view of this pandemic. I mean, yes, we worry now about inflation. And... In the early bit of your program, of course, you had Biden being interrogated by yeah. U.S. Uh, journalists about the rising cost of living there, which is over 5% mm-hmm. per annum. Um, but we had deflation for a while. Uh, we had deflation through the euro crisis uh, for a number of years in some of the countries, including Greece, that we discussed, but also uh, in Europe generally. And that is why uh, we, got, we saw interest rates there cut to negative, And they're still negative. One interest rate of the European Central Bank is negative. But of course, with COVID in particular, if you withdraw demand and obviously supply, everything closed down for a while, it's not surprising that you'd have very low inflation. In fact, you had negative energy prices. I mean, the oil was, the price of oil was negative. I remember. It's the most extraordinary yeah, I mean, thing. Very bizarre, wasn't it? Yeah. Very bizarre. Well, of course, it would bounce back when you remove restrictions and everything's happening. So the reason why the central bankers are saying it's transitory 
which I think it will be, the only question is for how long will it be transitory? You know, when will it really start coming down? Is because we've had this huge increase in demand and supply mm. has been able to respond. So what do you do if you raise interest rates then, and it's a global issue, so you know, gas prices going up, uh, commodity prices generally going up, mm. you're not going to have any real impact except slow down growth in your own economy. So you're penalizing you know, your own citizens. And the interesting thing is that we have here an inflation rate, which at just over 3%, isn't that great, but yes, it's above the 2% target, but it is considerably lower than the US at over 5%. And, yeah. that, and the one in the EU, or rather in the Eurozone, which is just over 4%. And yet, it looks like we might be the first country to raise interest rates. It, it doesn't make much you know, sense. It looks like we're going to. Do we have a good chancellor in Rishi Sunak? Well, he did the right thing on the COVID emergency. Uh, but of course, he wasn't the only country that reacted the way he did. Uh, the whole of Europe did the same. Lots of other countries did that too. The only one that didn't nevertheless spent even bigger percentage of GDP on mm. stimulus measures was the US, which didn't do the furlough scheme that we did. It just let everyone just lose their jobs, but gave them checks through the front doors. They all arrived. And also unemployment benefits went up very significantly, mm. which meant that people were able to survive. In fact, for many, it was much better to be unemployed than to have a job. Uh, it's one of the reasons why you see that everywhere. That oh yeah, uh, you know, I mean, in been, America, you know, labour shortages yes. on a most extraordinary level. I, mean, I never thought we'd see it there, you know. But unemployment has fallen, of course, very significantly, mm. and lots of jobs have been created. They haven't gone back to where they were, but it was a different way of doing it. It still cost a lot. In fact, as I was saying, it cost more for the US to do what it did than for all the other countries that did what Rishi Sunak did. And when some normality returns, and it's beginning to, it feels like it is. Is Brexit Britain going to do well? Well, you've seen the forecast from the Office of Budget Responsibility, which suggests that uh, we're not going to have long COVID, at least if it is, it's going to be yeah. mild, but we are going to have long Brexit. Uh, they think that uh, the economy will be 4% weaker as a result of Brexit. But they are the Treasury, it. and they are completely anti-Brexit, and they try to reverse the referendum. So I would kind of expect that from them, wouldn't I, really? Perhaps, but there are some really good economists there that I know of respect. <laughs> and it isn't really disagreeing much with what others are saying. Even the, the pro-Brexit economists did say that in the short term there'll be a negative impact on the economy. And the important thing is what types of policies do you put in place to, to change that? So, you know, we could become, well, you know, re su really supply, innovative. Supply side yeah. reform, I could argue. All that. Vicky, it's interesting. You've had a very, very distinguished career with some big highs. You've had one very dramatic low when you finish up in prison for a few months, and we won't drill down into the reasons for that. But you have tried to turn that around, to a, in a sense, to a positive, haven't you? You've, you've, you've written about prison, you've talked about prison. Does prison work? Well, I'm also involved in quite a lot of charities... Yeah, I know you are. ..that, that work on, on that. Uh, no, it doesn't. So I've written this book called Prisonomics, which looked at the cost of, A, and you know, keeping people in prison, yep. and and B, uh, what happens when they come out if they have already lost all sorts of positions in society, if you like, uh, and quite unable to get jobs. And that hits women in particular, who of course are much more tied to their homes and their families and their kids and their community, whereas men can move around much more easily. So men tend to get employed faster. But we have to punish out. people who've broken up. I mean, there has to be some form of punishment, doesn't there, for people who've broken the law? Oh, I think that's absolutely true. Uh, but, of course, when you look at the differences between men and women, that's why I got really interested in, in really writing about women more than the mm -hmm. men. They're generally doing, uh, you know, committing crimes which are quite low-key. They, they Not paying the BBC licence fee. Being for example. One of them. For example. Uh, and usually non-violent. And what the evidence shows is that quite often, you know, in fact, the majority of them have been abused at some point. Uh, or have been coerced, or have been doing the various crimes because they're trying to feed the drug habits of their other half, if you like. Yeah. So, but what they need is quite a lot of uh, emphasis on dealing with mental issues. So quite a lot of the charities I'm involved with uh, have women's centres which try and avoid to, you know, getting these women to prison to begin with, if you like, or look after them when they come out. And the most important thing in terms of really stopping the reoffending, which is costing mm. b something like 10 billion a year. It's unbelievable. Uh, it's unbe is to make sure that they have jobs. Yeah. And that is 
crucial and getting them to be employed is the important no, well, I think, I think, as I say, I think you've turned a, a big negative um, around in many ways. So what next, Vicky? You, you've had the highs and the lows and you're back busy as an economist. And as I said, I think economics is going to become a much bigger issue in our lives over the next few years. What, you've had a very interesting life today. What next? Well, I probably will continue to do the economics, and with a bit of luck, yeah. uh, your prediction is correct that I will be in, in demand. Um, but obviously, politics has, has always been an interest in terms of influencing what happens, and I yeah. think I'll want to continue to be involved in that. Very good. That was Vicky Price on Talking Pints. <laughs>Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. My favourite time of the day, the GB News pub is open and joining me in it tonight is Conservative Member of Parliament, Michael Fabricant. Michael, welcome. Thank you very much. To the GB News pub. I I'm loving it, except for one thing. You, yes. You, you won't believe this. Go on. They got me a really nice bottle of Chianti. Yes. But it had a cork in it. And you know what? The pub doesn't have a corkscrew. I don't so I've believe had it. to go for this inferior bottle. <laughs> <laughs> this inferior bottle. I'm sure it'll be lovely. Well... We had previously Christopher Biggins complained about the lack of ice. <laughs> he said it was a rotten pub, but we now have an ice machine, so a corkscrew is coming. Cheers. Given <laughs> what we've been told today in Glasgow, that the, the, the world's going to end in catastrophe, we may as well have a drink, it seems yeah. to me. If you've got to go... <laughs> go sloshed is my, uh, <laughs> my great... Oh, it's very good, actually. Good. <laughs> what do you make of Boris today? I mean, the plagues of locust business. I, I mean, he's gone from being sceptical about all of this. I mean, he's now sort of... He, well, he really dad, is an Old Testament his prophet. His dad is a big influence as well. Uh, you know, I mean, he really has been a campaigner for a long time on these mm. issues. Uh, I don't think I'm as sceptical as you are on this one, but, you know, I think we've got to do something well, I'm skeptical, soon. Michael, I'm sceptical about what we're doing in the name of it. That's what I'm sceptical about. I'm sceptical about 
wind technology. I'm sceptical about the cost it yeah. puts on ordinary folk. That's where and I come indeed, from. And indeed, you know, the amount of pollution that comes in just producing an electric battery. Yeah. And at the moment, I'm hanging on to my electric, uh, onto my petrol car. Yes. Because the Israelis and the Americans are working on a new form of battery technology, which will be cleaner to manufacture. And you know what? It'll charge up in about six minutes from empty and go for 600 miles. That, to me, is a battery. No, if we... Uh, look, I'm all for this stuff if it works, but what I'm not for is this massive transference of money from the poor to the rich and that's what's really got me down through all of this plus I'm all for uh, you know in environmental measures I mentioned fish stocks just yeah, a moment yeah. ago uh, you know trees carbon sequestration nature all of that Michael it's interesting you've been in Parliament nearly 30 years but you're not the type that went to Oxford and did PPE and and whilst you were always active in politics you had a life before politics. Well, very much so. And I wasn't active in politics, actually, uh, really, until near the very end when I then did get to Parliament, because my background was... I was at university, OK? I didn't do PPE, but no. I was at university. Yeah. Uh, several universities. And while I was there, I put together a radio consortium to run a commercial radio station in Sussex. And uh, I'd worked in the BBC before that and uh, Pirate Radio. And uh, could be arrested if I go into too much detail. Pirate Red, that must have been fun. That was huge fun. <laughs> huge fun. But very, very dangerous if you wanted to stay out of prison. But you know what? A friend of mine went to court and was taken to court by the Home Office. And there was this trial. And the magistrate, I think it was a magistrate rather than a Crown Court thing, and the magistrate said, Look, I, what I don't understand, perhaps the Home Office can explain, what harm has the defendant actually done? He's played a few records. He's provided enjoyment for a lot of people. I'm dealing all the time with bag snatchers and all the rest of it. What harm has he done being a pirate radio, and he refers to his notes, disc jockey? <laughs> <laughs> and that's the truth of it. But anyways, um, so... I think you were asking, how did I... Well, no, what I'm become... saying is... No, what I'm saying is this. I find it quite refreshing that we have MPs like you, who and you worked as a school teacher for a bit. Only for an hour. Only for a year. An hour. An hour. hour. A year. <laughs> it's a wine already. <laughs> but, you, but, but you did do that for a bit, but then you had this career in radio, this career in media... Um, and, and, and setting up radio stations around the world. And, in fact, what well, was sorry to interrupt you... No, go but on. That's what brought me into politics, actually, because I was doing uh, radio stations in 48 different countries around the world, which a lovely lady, who I'm going to quote now, Charlotte Owen from Number 10, said, well, that's about 25% of every country in the world. And I'd never thought of it like that before. And they had our radio stations, and it did two things for me. One is it made me a Eurosceptic. Did it? Because my company had to bribe to win contracts, not only in places when it was still legal to do that, and you had to do it, mm -hmm. otherwise it would have simply gone to the French, the Germans or the Americans who were all bribing, not only in countries that you would expect to do it, third world developing countries, we had to do it to the ORTF in France, like the BBC. I mean, the only kosher European countries were Holland and Scandinavia. There was mm. no bribery. And Belgium, actually. There was no and bribery. And cultures there similar to ours, actually. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And it was a joy. And this produced the Euroscepticism. It was a joy doing business in the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and other countries which were English-speaking, had English law, were flexible, and were incorruptible. Yeah. And that made me think, you know, because... I, we're going ahead of myself, but when I was interviewed for the Litchfield Parliamentary Constituency, yeah. I was asked, well, all right, then, what one thing do you not agree with that the government believes in? And I said, well, the one thing is I think we'd be better off out of Europe. You were saying it all those years ago. All those years yeah. ago. So I was a Brexiteer before the word was invented. Yeah. But what got me to be an MP was two things. One is I had problems exporting to a particular country where the rival companies from other countries, those countries were offering all sorts of, not bribes, but maybe they were bribes in a mm. way. They were incentives like, we'll pay for your chief engineer to come for six months over to our country to mm. learn, blah, blah, yeah. blah. So they were providing funding. And I went to our High Commission, 
uh, in Uganda, actually, it was, having said I wasn't going to say. And uh, they weren't interested in commerce in those days. And I wrote to my Member of Parliament, who was a marvellous man, the Right Honourable Sir Julian Amory. Oh, yes. Down in Brighton. Yes, 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 yes. And he contacted the minister, and I went to see the minister in the end. The minister was a barrister. And I said, well, what the hell are you doing being in charge of uh, exports? When you're a barrister, you've never run anything in your life. No, you're no, an no. advocate, but no. that's it. Well, yeah. that's my point, isn't it? Mm. That's my but point. he said to me, yeah, because people like you, Michael, mm. who are obviously conservative, because we hadn't mm. even discussed politics, but who are obviously conservative, never become MPs. Mm. And then... And, and had you made some money doing all of that? I had made money doing it. And that helped I think as well. it helped. Well, yes. it means I'm not interested in other jobs. Some would say and it's because I'm unemployable, but... Uh, and, well, <laughs> well, that's often a very good quality. <clears throat> but that means actually... The, I, mean, I mean, you know, you have held positions in the party, but you're basically happy being a backbencher, aren't you? Well, the problem I had, I had to resign in the end because uh, I've got a real problem with HS2, mm -hmm. which goes through my beautiful Litchfield constituency. Mm -hmm. It doesn't stop. Cost a fortune. And it's not even connected to I anything. The, the, the rise of UKIP was becoming a problem for you, wasn't it? Well, this is right. And can we just get something on the record now? Yeah. And that is, this is the first time... David Cameron, if you're watching this, <laughs> I want you to make a note of this. And the chief whip at the time, make a note of this. This is the first time you and I have actually met. Properly, yeah. We, yeah. We, properly, yeah. yeah. We were at a dinner together yeah, once, yeah, and we were looking yeah, at each other, yeah, but yeah. it's the first time we've yeah, properly yeah, met. Yeah. Yeah, and what I said, I was in charge of running our by-elections at the time, which, actually, we used to win. And uh, I wrote a paper called The Pact. And in order to get publicity, because I got nowhere with number 10 over this, David Cameron, lovely guy, but he would go very pink in the face and get very angry as soon as I mentioned anything about this. So I thought, bugger it, we're going to get this now. He didn't like me very much. He, did didn't, he? Like <laughs> he didn't like you at all, because I will tell you... That, God, this sounds so creepy, but I will tell you, I said to him, Nigel Farage should be... Knighted, at least. <laughs> Why? He has changed the face of the United Kingdom for the better. <laughs> and if it hadn't been for him, you know, we'd still be in the European Union. The wretched Anyway, England. he went very pink in the face about that as yeah, well. Like but that. the point of the whole thing was that I came up with this thing called The Pact, which yeah. got a lot of publicity at the time, and which said, basically, unless we have a pact with UKIP or do something else, because I never thought we would have a pact with UKIP, another yeah. party, that wouldn't happen, or do something else, which like, did happen... Like offer a referendum. Like a referendum. Yes, yes. We'll never really get uh, a real government, because a lot of Conservatives feel very depressed yeah. about... But here's the funny thing, Michael. When you were talking about a pact, and a lot of the press were speculating around this as well, the irony of it all was, actually, in the 2015 general election, Cameron got the majority because of the number of Labour people that voted for this. And this, this was an issue that crossed... I think left-right politics, Absolutely. remarkably. And it's... Look, I've been moaning about fishing tonight, and with good reason, and I can't stand the Northern Ireland thing, but it, but it is done. It's over. There's no going back. One last quick thought. You were there for the budget last week. Was that a Conservative budget? It was a pragmatic budget. <laughs> there are times, <laughs> you know, when, when you've got to be a little bit diplomatic. It was a pragmatic <laughs> budget well, in are. difficult circumstances. Now, you can tell folks from a language Michael Fabricant is not leaving politics any time soon, but we thank him for coming in with us on Talking Pines. Earlier today, I went down to Sloan Square to collect, help collect money for the poppy appeal myself. Let's have a look. <laughs> 1921 was when the Royal British Legion launched their first ever poppy appeal. It's the centenary this year. Today, I'm with the branch here, the Chelsea and Kensington branch. I'm here with Charlie Mullins, you can see somewhere here from Pimlico Plumbers. We've got some servicemen, ex-servicemen, collecting money. And the Legion still does very, very important work. We're not just remembering those that fell in the First World War, the Second World War, but, of course, those that are injured and still suffering from Iraq and Afghanistan. So the Legion does terrific work. Right, brilliant. There we go. There's the box. There's your poppy. Marvellous. Thank you very much. People are coming up and, and they're putting sort of 20 quids in. I'm absolutely astonished. Absolutely. I thought maybe the old fiver or whatever. But it just shows you how generous people are and 
talking to the guys that do this regularly at these big London stations, I mean, they raise thousands of pounds every day doing this. It's absolutely amazing. Thank you. The whole act of remembrance is something that brings the country together uh, and also makes us realise, through the Commonwealth, how many other people around the world have contributed so much so that we can be a free country. So I'm really pleased and proud to be here. And I really was. David Dade, welcome to Talking Thank you. Pints. Nice to meet you. Great Michael. to see you. Now, you're wearing one or two medals there. You've yes. been in the Army. Been in the Merchant Navy first. Yep. Then I was in the Army. Yep. Came out and I've worked in security and that ever since. But I've been doing the Poppy Appeal since 1966 after the Poppy Appeal or the British Legion helped my yep. parents when they had illnesses and that, they were very good to them. So you and my way of giving it so, back. So your parents were ex service. My father was ex service in the Coldstream Guards. Yep. And in what way did the British Legion help them? Well, they mother was ill, father had a stroke, and they helped they got um, put them into got them into a nice flat, um, helped with the white goods in the house yep. and things like that. And as my way of saying thank you, I have worked with the Poppets Peel various places ever since. So you talked about the great work the Legion did for your parents and, and clearly the great work the Legion continue uh, yes. to do. Something interesting I've noticed. In the last few years, you see villages, small towns, where they've got big poppies up on the lampposts. Yes, yes. In a way, they didn't 20 years ago. No, no. Is it, could it, I don't know what your view is, but could it be, David, that Perhaps because of Afghanistan and Iraq, it's brought to a younger generation don't this idea the, of loss and suffering. Yeah, but don't forget the Falklands before that, 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, things change. Poppy pill has got to change. And it's got to change for the better to help a younger generation of injured soldiers. And, um, and of course it has. No, of course so, it has, yeah. And the way, only way to do that is to increase what we're selling, or not selling, what we're asking people to donate, how we are envisaged. Um, we now have the new logo, which I'm wearing there. Yep. If they can see it. Did it need a new logo? Um, yes, I think we have to go with the times. All right. We're in the 21st century, and we need to... To go with the with the times and the public reaction, because you know we've heard, and there are some lines of argument in this country today. You know, uh, that look back on everything to do with British history as if it's shameful. Um, are you finding there are some younger people today that are resentful? There are, but if they come and talk to me, I will explain to them um, what it's all about. It's not just about us, the English, or us, the British. It's about all who lost their lives during the conflicts. Um, World War One, World War Two, Burma, oh, Malaysia. I mean, you can go on and yeah, on I mean, and there was, on. There was barely, barely been a year, you know. Exactly. I, I think was it only sixty-eight? It was the only year we didn't lose somebody yes. in, on 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 active service. That's right. And because of that, I will say say to them, look. There goes, but for the grace of God. So you don't get hostility, then? If I get it, I walk away because I don't want the hostility. I want the friendship of everybody. Yeah, well, look, I have to say, I've never been out before and collected for the British Legion because I was in elected politics, and it, yes. it didn't seem to be appropriate to do it. But having gone out today and met you and met the gang down there in Sloan Square, um, I was very inspired by what you all do. It was pretty cold, but, it was. but that didn't seem to stop any of you. <laughs> no, uh, no. But no, I just feel, and yes, there may be some that, 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 that question what we do and question Churchill, mm -hmm. but I generally feel the poppy appeals bigger than it ever was. And who would have thought that we'd have brought back not just Remembrance Sunday, but now a lot of businesses and places stop at 11 o'clock on yes. the 11th of yes. November. So it do. seems to have got bigger, not smaller. I, I agree there, it has. I think people in business are actually suddenly realising, yes, we should remember what our fathers, our grandfathers, our 
they were in a conflict. Some of them lost their lives. Yes, we should remember. Yeah. And it is fantastic. What about you earlier? I looked at the medals that you got, and you've got one medal there that is really unusual for a Brit. I'd like you to share it with us. You mean my Vietnam medal? Yes. Well, yeah. I was in the, when I was in the Merchant Navy, I was on tanker. Don't ask me the name of it, because I can never remember it. <laughs> but we went up the Delta delivering fuel to the Americans. And because of it, the Americans decreed that any British that sailed with and delivered was part of the conflict, so was entitled to the medal. Mine was given to me, I think it's nearly 20 years ago now, by the American ambassador at a function at the embassy. Fantastic. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased as a country we didn't go to in, get involved well, in yes. Vietnam. Yes. I, was, I think one of Harold Wilson's pretty best decisions that he yes. ever made. Yes. But there can't be many of you that have no, got that No, there's not. Level. I don't think there are. I've I don't never... think there's that many left alive now because I was a youngster. Yeah. I was 15. You were 15? Yes. What were you I doing was... in a conflict zone at 15? I was a galley boy in the kitchen. Right, yeah, well, there you are. And actually, and actually... If you go back through the last 100 years or more of all of this, there's an awful lot of 14 and 15-year-olds that were actually killed, yes. lost at sea and killed yes. and all the rest yes. of it. But you've got the Vietnam Medal, and that, I think, is pretty blooming special. Will Thank the you. Queen... Do, we don't know yet whether the Queen's going to be attending on Remembrance Sunday, do we? But um, how important The whisper is that? is that, yes, she is. That's the whisper. That's the that's inside the, story. That's the whisper it? that she will, she will attend. If not outside, she will be up in the balcony where they all stand normally, just so she can be there. Because that's a pretty important part of all oh, of yes, this. Oh, yes, it's part it? of her life. Part like, of her life. And... Exactly like, no, it, it's part of her life. She is our patron. Yeah, no, I know. And because of it, I think she wants to be there. It's like Troop in the Colour. She would always be there if she could one way or another. Yeah. Well, thank goodness she is, because, of course, Prince Philip did amazing work. Oh, yes. Uh, with all of the all of the different military uh, charities yes. and the yes. Legion and everything. And, of course, at, at the Field of Remembrance at Westminster Abbey... Yes. ..he'd retired from it and Prince Harry had stepped in. Yes, but... Um, and we'd all thought, well, maybe he were there for many, many years to come, but that's clearly not going to happen. Um, it's, 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 it's not going to be easy. No. To find raw patronage in the future, as good as well, you've had in the past. Um, I'm hoping we will. Um, I think little George, when he gets a bit older, will step up. Right, there we are. David Dale has put his faith in little George. And, folks, isn't it great that we have people in this country who are prepared to go out and give of their free time in, I can assure you, all weathers, uh, and to raise money for the British Legion and to help people of all ages, all generations, all backgrounds, all nationalities understand why remembrance and wearing a poppy is a very, very special, important thing in our country. David Dade, thank you for thank coming you. in and talking to me. Thank you. <laughs>